uh, so later we're going to have to still get time. This talk is going to be in English, and that's uh, because I don't speak to be any Spanish. Or, uh, okay. So trust me, it's better to do it in English. Uh, okay. um, I'm sorry to be here today. I'm, uh, I'm Karsten. I'm the CEO of eDreams. eDreams is um, yeah, a large travel company, but also a large technology company. And we're actually based in Barcelona, so we have um, a size of a team. I'll tell you a little bit about this. I'm going to talk to you about how agile um, and the really architecture processes people fit together in, in one picture. It's really, I think, it's three, three sides of the same thing that you really cannot separate. And I'm talking a little bit about our journey um, when we took from a monolith to uh, a more nimble, more, more agile organization. So um, let's get started. If you have any questions, you can do it in an interactive way. Um, I know it's a little bit like a cinema here, um, but I appreciate if there's some conversation happening as well. I trust me talking. Uh, let me just introduce uh, eDreams um, real quick um, to get started. Um, we're a travel company um, among the largest online travel companies in the world, actually, um, based on flights. We operate five major uh, consumer brands. And probably, if you're from Spain, uh, I think the majority of people here, you probably know eDreams best, that's a brand that's uh, number one in Spain. But we have many other brands that are number one, number two across Europe. Uh, we have um, Photo, Traveling, Voyage, uh, and Vigo. Um, we're actually operating 261 um, websites. Uh, we have 18 million customers traveling with us um, every year. And we power the um, completely amazing and disturbing number of 1.7 billion um, searches every month. Uh, so that's quite, quite some numbers. Uh, we do this with a team of about 600 people in IT. Uh, it's around a little bit more than 400 developers that we have. So it's a really heavy product development organization. Um, the flight business is, is a tough business. Yeah. Uh, flights is it's almost a commodity product. People don't want to pay extra for a flight. Um, you can get the same flight at different points of sales. You can buy it at an airline, you can buy it at, uh, buy it at um, another OTA. It's, there's a tough competition in this. Um, we believe that the way to win this competition is through our product. So we're really a, a technology company, a software company, that wants to win customers over the product that we're building. So it's completely essential for our success. And that's why we are also so investing so heavily. Um, we are based in Barcelona, like I said. Um, we do have um, a large mm -hmm. center in Madrid as well. Um, we do have um, developers in Alicante yeah. and Palma. And we're right now opening the development centers in Milano and in Porto uh, right now. So um, we're more in the south um, of Europe and trying to get talent yeah. about this. Um, Agile for us is, is really a journey that's been, that we've been on for, um, for a while. Um, we, are, we are right now having 52 teams. All of our teams are working inside a pod. Um, pods are multidisciplinary teams, Agile teams. Um, uh, we have eight Agile coaches um, that are looking after these um, teams. Actually, a lot of them are here, the ones in the blue shirt. So if you have any questions or want to challenge them on Agile, uh, yes, uh, you can heckle them later. Um, and you do see Agile going beyond just pure product development or just pure coding um, piece. We're also incorporating data science and, and other aspects, uh, marketing research, um, and things into, um, into our pods. And actually, there's, all, there's pods creating spontaneously on the business side, people calling themselves a pod now. Uh, because they want to want to, uh, want to work in an HR way, and the HR coaches are all supporting that. So we see that not only on development, but across the business um, happening. And we really want to take it into like a learning organization that has that's continuously improving um, as we go around. I don't think I have to tell you much about this, uh, because it, I, I guess that's what you do. Um, so you're probably familiar with all of these concepts. Let me t uh, talk to you about how we get there, because when all of this started, um, it it more looked like this. Um, anyone knows what that is? 
it's a nice picture of a big ball of mud. Um, a big ball of mud is a very technical term. It's a system that is really connected to everything at the same time. Now, if you want to change something, you're going to have to wear these gloves and go like really deep inside to change something. And everything you change is causing something else to fail. Yeah, it's like a con connected, connected mess. Um, it's technically you can call it a monolith, but um, I think the big ball of mud is, is the, the better, the better picture um, of this. And, and you know we had a monolith um, a while ago, and uh, probably that's the feet of the, the person who's managing this. You're like completely stuck. You cannot move in a monolith. It's really difficult to move with this thing. Um, so we were on a journey to uh, to really make that monolith more manageable. Um, and just to explain why that is important for us and, and why excellence in making that is important for us, I, I brought a, a completely scientific graph here um, that is a bit complicated to explain, but uh, it has two axes. This is the original graph, let me explain it. It has two axes. Um, one axis at, on, on the left hand side is, is the alignment, it's how well um, your, the things that you're doing for is, is linked to what the business needs to achieve. And on the other axis is how well you do these things. What is your effectiveness in that? And the interesting thing is that most companies are focused really focused on the alignment piece. We run large sessions of portfolio processes, of discussions at management level of what should we work on, is this the right thing um, to do? Um, and, and not so much on the effectiveness uh, side of things. It turns out, and this is data from a, from a survey that um, a consulting firm did together with a university, that companies who are really in the, uh, investing only in the alignment, I mean, which means only getting doing the right things, are actually underperforming in the market. And these are all metrics you can use to impress your uh, financial guys in the, in the company. Um, but they show that they're actually you're spending more money and they're growing less rapidly if you're just focusing on, on the business side of things, of the achievements. What you need to focus on first is having an effective <laughs> company and an effective mechanism uh, for product development. Because if you don't do that first, you'll never be able to afford it later. Because once you're stuck in the uh, less effective side of things, you will not have the growth rates, you will not have the money to invest in an IT organization or a product development organization that's going to be lean and nimble. So the, the important thing is to shift the conversation into how to really break up this big ball of mud and, and turn it into like something that's more HR. It's more important to have that conversation first before you start discussing business strategy and the second thing. So um, I, I've brought a couple of learnings and advices from, from, um, from, from my life. Um, now, you know all the caveats around advices and about models and around not to copy and uh, not everything is applicable. The stuff I'm going to share with you is applicable for our situation. I, I do believe there is some, some wisdom in it. Um, but it's use your own judgment. Don't copy, don't copy blindly. Um, and the key to that is, is Conway. So who knows Conway's law? Yes, okay, so, okay, uh, half of the room. Uh, Conway's law is saying that um, the the architecture of what you're uh, producing as a system and the organization are actually linked to each other. So basically, every ar architecture is, a, is a, a replica of the organization and, and, and vice versa. So if you have an organization that's uh, very um, siloed, you're going to end up having an architecture that's going to be very siloed. Um, which means that you cannot just go in and say, OK, I want to change this big ball of mud. Um, just so like a technical exercise. It means that you're going to have to look at architecture, organization, people and processes together. And it's really these three things that I want to talk about today. I don't believe that anyone um, any profession can, can tackle this alone. It's not an HR job. It's not a technical job. And it's not an HR job. You will not succeed if you're just doing it on an HR way or just on an HR way or just on a technical way. You're going to have to do it at the three levers have to move at the same time. Otherwise, it will not work. So how do you move these three at the same time? What worked for us? The, the first thing is 
Um, we'll write some super high level guidance on, on, on where you're going. Um, it's almost like having a 10 uh, commandments written down. Um, because you're going to be on a, on a change process for people. And people need some, some vision and some guidance on where is this change process leading to. You don't want to uh, spell out the change process in every tiny detail across all of the steps because you cannot do that. You want to tackle it in a more agile way. But you're going to have, from the beginning, uh, be able to give some guidance around this. So what we did on this is we created um, seven principles. Um, I shared it with the teams um, that should really govern our thinking. Um, the seven um, principles for us, it started with the customer at the, at the center. And we said our highest priority is to satisfy the customer um, through early and continuous delivery of product features that we're going to do. It went out to um, technical and operational excellence. We want to continuously attend uh, our technical excellence and good design. Um, and we added this with operational excellence as a chief, and each and every employee can see the results of the work um, and fix that flow um, when it breaks. It goes on with continuously delivering value, and just spilling out that you want to continuously deliver small parts of value for our customers. We want to have a product thinking and not a project thinking in, in the um, organization. It means we develop our products based on data, experimentation, and fast feedback. I think there's a huge difference between project approach, also in organizations, and the product approach. We want to go to the product thinking. So saying that it's important to have happy and engaged employees that are really driving all of this. Um, it's about global thinking as one team and the alignment um, to, uh, to make it happen. And the last one is um, we want to create small business-oriented pods. Business means customer-oriented pods that can work relatively autonomously. Um, and that means that there's a couple of things in this. There, uh, that means that you're going to have to have end-to-end -end ownership inside the pod. You run it, you build it, or oh, actually the other way around, you build it, you run it, um, and you, you own it. You, you not only own the development aspect of it, you own it that it works in the face of the customer. It also means autonomy because we scaled up our development quite a bit. I think we went from, I don't know, 20 teams to 52 teams. And if you, if you don't create autonomy um, for the teams, that means that the, the, your cost of um, uh, talking to each other is actually increasing logarithmically. So in the end, you might end up having actually less development throughput because everyone is talking to everyone. You're going to have to make it smaller and more uh, manageable to digest. We defined these seven principles two years ago, three years ago, I think it's three years ago, um, to really align our thinking and tell everyone, hey, that's the direction we're gonna move, we're gonna move in. Um, give a high level guidance so that people know what to expect in, in that journey. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, it's a, a core, one of the core beliefs and um, I don't know if you know this, this person on the uh, well on your left side. Uh, anyone knows who that person is? No? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you who that. <laughs> this is Machiavelli. Um, and I'm using something out of Machiavellian playbook here. Huh? Um, and the sense I like to use is put the pain where it belongs. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a, a system, an organization, where the pain is not um, at the right place, you will not see change. Um, I, I give you an example. We had a, an organization where um, we had teams working on new features, and they would put these features live, and we had another team that would come in and do the maintenance. So what do you think this creates in terms of dynamics of creating uh, well and quality software for these teams? Not, huh? because the pain about that damn thing not working was as the other team you know, that, that couldn't help it, that had to fix it. So you're gonna have to create something that the pain is where it really um, belongs. Another example is um, he processing a lot of, a lot of files from, from, from other vendors. <laughs> and sometimes these 
events like sales reports or um, accounting things. And, and sometimes these files are incorrect. The, the other, the third parties are messing up the files. So we have a team that is constantly fixing these files and they really, you know, they're not very happy about it that it all fails. But the business unit who's actually interfacing with these partners is not feeling that pain. The pain is felt by the IT team and not by the business team. So you're going to have to change that. You're going to have to think about mechanisms of really transfer and switch the pain. Because um, only if the pain is felt, people will change. So it sounds a little bit evil, um, but I, uh, well, maybe it is a little bit evil, but, uh, <laughs> no, but I believe it's for a good cause. Because um, if you feel the pain, um, you, will, you will be motivated to do some changes around this. The, the third one is um, from moving from I shapes to T shapes. Um, when, when we started this journey, we had a lot of people who came in and said, hey, I'm a software developer. Software developers don't test. Yeah? That's called a tester. I develop. I don't care if it runs in production correctly. It works on my machine. Um, so maybe that resonates. I see some people saying yes. I've heard that. You know, that, I think that mindset doesn't 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 work for for multiple reasons. Um, we want to take make the people more end to end accountable. I truly believe that people will be happier and more engaged if they own um, a process from end to end. Um, if they are not just in a functional silo of their own profession. Some people need to be convinced of that. Huh? That's, that's also because there is also like a comfort of being in your silo. Um, and being in a silo is being, you know, I'm just developing, I'm an I. We, we are saying you want to be that you want to be your, that you are a T, which means you're still deep in your profession, but you're adding the things that are to left and to right or upstream and downstream of you. And you have an opinion, you have an, um, an, an, a knowledge about this, and you really think about this optimization across the entire flow and not just it works for me because if, if it works for me um, we are not getting anywhere in terms of scaling this up in an HL, in an HL way. So we've been defining job profiles for our developers um, across the board and we're putting more T-shaped features into these job profiles so that they actually do the testing, um, they, they look after it in production they check if the metrics are, are there, if the feature is working in face of the customer. They work on the ideation um, piece. So all of these things, up and downstream, we want them to do as well. To make it more holistic for them and to also uh, engage them more in what they're doing. And um, the fourth one, it's a, okay, it is a video, but uh, actually uh, you cannot see it on the PDF, that's true. Um, this guy is falling off the, the, uh, the, the treadmill. Um, I originally, I call this, if it hurts, do it more often. Uh, but I, it's, it sounds a bit controversial, so I put it a bit nicer. And I call it continuously increased frequency. Um, and I want to make an example, not at eDreams, but uh, at a previous company, um, what that means to me. Um, in, the, in the previous company, um, I worked for this, um, actually, Scout, it's a big internet company in, um, in Europe, in, in, based in Germany. Um, every release had to go through um, a database administrator. The database administrator wanted to personally look at every release and make sure all of the database is correct before it went out live. Um, and that was a lot of work for them. It was like a manual process and you know, they took their time and then they said okay or not okay and we went back and forth. Um, we told them okay guys, um, that's, that's great. Um, you can do that. Um, we're going to increase the frequency of releases to, to five releases a day. Um, and the guy said, no, what the fuck? Uh, sorry, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I cannot look at five releases a day. It's going to be it's way too painful for me. And he said, yeah. I said, OK, sorry, I, I don't care. Um, that, that's your problem. Um, and just by saying that and, and by, by cranking up the frequency, we induced the need for change on their side. 
because they were completely focused on doing it manually before. And after two, three, uh, four days, they came back and said, hey, um, maybe it's uh, a better idea if um, we work on automation. That change was so much easier because we did that. Uh, because if I went, went to them and said, told them, hey, let's work on automation, it's much more difficult to convince someone. But, but just you know, putting the pain where it belongs and cranking up um, uh, the pain lever, uh, it actually worked very well. You might get the idea that I'm a very nasty person now after this talk. <laughs> uh, I don't see myself as that, but I, I, I do believe that um, increasing the frequency is important. And I do believe that by increasing the frequency, um, there will be a lot of things that are coming up um, that are working suboptimal that you can tackle afterwards. Let's put it a little bit nicer. Yeah, and the, and the fourth, uh, the fifth one, um, and, and the last um, one um, I want to share is um, moving from a functional organization to a domain based organization. And this is something that um, we've been doing at Etrium, but it's something that I see across the organization, or across the, um, across the industry. So a functional organization is, I'm development, I'm production, I'm architecture, I'm, I'm agile, uh, but you know what a functional organization is. Huh? Like in a way, siloed, but then you build some kind of process on top of it to make it work together. We're moving away from that, and we're moving um, the different departments together into what we call domains. And our domains are oriented towards the customer. For example, we have a domain for um, selling flights, or we have a domain for hotels. And inside that domain, we have development functions, we have architecture, we have um, an HR coach um, in the domain, uh, we have QA uh, people in the domain, and I see that as a Know, evolving into a small IT department uh, of sorts. Because we want to have, I mean, we want to, I want to delegate leadership to a level where it makes sense, where people are connected to the business. Um, and the only way of doing that is to you know, create a unit that has a purpose, has a mission, um, and there is a lot of communication and, and, and conversation going on inside that unit um, to actually make it happen. So that the actual functional leaders are the ones that are just looking after um, joint ways of working, maybe, um, or, or enabling these these domains. Um, I like the chief enabling officer. That's uh, I think how I see the IT leadership as well. <laughs> but the actual management of the day-to-day -day activities can happen at the level of that business domain, so much closer towards um, the customer, much closer towards the people, uh, and. You know, I, um, much closer to the, to the and with people who know what they're doing uh, because they're really connected to it. Because there's a filter in the organization, the higher it gets up, it, it gets more complex. So I, mean, I took a picture from the Berlin Wall and showing how that's, um, I think it's the same example of breaking down the barriers uh, and really create a, a joint way of working on that. Yeah, these are the five things that I wanted to share um, with you. What it has done for us, um, and I, I, I took this. Um, it's actually uh, real data from, from us. In the last, uh, yes, it's basically two years, one and a half years, um, we've been reducing our customer lead time from idea in to feature life uh, by 70%, and we have increased the releases that we're running uh, by 325% of doing that. And I truly believe that it's not the result of any single action, but it's really a combination of what you're doing across all of the th three domains um, in terms of um, technology, people, and processes that kind of powers this kind of acceleration for the company. That's basically all I wanted to share. Um, can I answer you some questions on this? Yes, please. Okay, when, so the question was, when moving from I-shaped to T-shaped, um, what kind of initiatives do we do? Um, and I, I think it, it kind of links back to what I've, I've shown. I think it starts with spreading the awareness um, of um, what we want um, to achieve. So basically telling everyone, 
you're not just going to be um, a um, developer anymore, you're also going to test your own software and you're going to make sure it runs in production. Um, I think that's a bit the first step. Um, we also anchor this in our, um, in, 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 in our competency profiles for, for developers. We put them on, on trainings um, and, and support them with trainings. And then we also change some roles. So for example, previously we had um, QA testers inside some of the teams. We didn't have 50 testers, but we had uh, QA testers. And we worked with the QA testers to reshape the role and move it from doing the test into facilitating the test. Um, and we actually had, had them work on this proposal. So it's a change that they have been driving. Um, with many of the mechanisms that I've mentioned here, right? including the pain, the frequency, until the moment they could say, I cannot test anymore. So they got to the realization, hey, you're going to have to change. I'm going to have to get everyone else on board. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, generally, that's how we do these things. So it's not so much like a top-down initiative. Um, it's more about inducing the organization to, to change uh, by itself, um, and then supporting that change. Yes, please. Did you talk about the pain? Are you talking about the pain or gratitude? Um, so we, we have the concept of a domain and we have the concept of a value stream uh, for us. Oh. So it, yes, we have both. And, and let me explain why. Um, a domain for me is, um, for us, is, is a persistent <coughs> customer facing um, piece of the uh, delivery organization. So we have, uh, we have a domain for selling flights, we have a domain for selling hotels. A value stream might be something that is across domains. So for if we work on improving our um, <coughs> mobile experience on mobile web, a mobile web user on there on, um, on that might, might book a, uh, a flight and book a hotel. So that's in two different domains, but we want that to be coordinated. Uh, and that's where you use value streams for to actually have um, yeah, the uh, uh, lightweight coordination, it's not really an org structure, but it's lightweight coordination um, across different domains. Um, but you, in the end, the domain is owning customer-facing KPIs yeah, for, for, that, for that area. It's, it's more, it's, I think the value things for us are more, um, how to say, um, they, they can be changing over time, whereas the domains you want to keep relatively stable. Yeah. Yeah. So my question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so the question was related to principles, as um, e Dreams is an organization of 500 people or more. Yeah. So, how did you, uh, as an organization, develop those principles that basically define uh, define you as an organization in the competitive landscape, and how you communicated, aligned all all the teams? Because I think this is very interesting. You know how how to get the buy-in from from all the participants in the company. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so the principles are shared. I didn't just put them up here again. Um, they're the principles for the product development. So they're not for the entire organization. Um, we develop them in, inside our, um, in, inside really inside the leadership team. Um, probably now I would do it. I would have more involvement, but at the time we were doing it inside the leadership team. Um, in terms of you know, putting the the stake in the ground, saying that's where we want to take the organization. So it's kind of more the when I, when I joined, I wanted to give um, everyone clarity upon what I stand about, uh, what I stand for. So the people don't, are not in doubt or uh, have, have questions of you know, what, uh, what should be my thinking. That's, that's more how I used it. We didn't use a bottom-up process um, at that time. It was more uh, like the leadership team um, doing it. Um, and then we have been communicating um, or, um, this um, heavily and we had the teams reflect. We had, uh, we had sessions about is anyone disagreeing, is there like a major point that we need to, uh, to change and there's there is change that happens um, because of this um, in these principles. Um, yeah, and, and we started then to incorporate them into 
uh, our, our thinking and many of the actions that we have been uh, driving need to link back to principles in a, in a way of communication. So the question was how do <laughs> the question was how do you control the principles that we lift? Um, and, and it's a good question. I, I we don't have a great answer for that. Uh, so we did not run a, like a monthly test on uh, do you know the principles or how well are you are, are you following them? Um, we just incorporated them in, in the way we we're, we're thinking and communicating. But we did not do a test uh, or, or any controlling um, aspect um, around this. We've been, or I've been really um, heavily investing in, um, in sharing. Um, we've been, we were running things like um, all hands processes. We just had one a couple of weeks back where we have um, all the all employees come in, um, so go through different, like a the world cafe or like different different stations where they can learn about um, topics. Um, and this is actually changing right now. It's actually getting more bottom up. Uh, process. We see that actually taking root and, and being incorporated more and more. But we don't have a formal principal adhesion report, uh, so to say. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned one of the principles is happiness and engagement. I was yeah. wondering if, uh, if there's a way that you actually are implementing to measure that or to make sure that you actually are going in the right direction, probably collaborating with HR or something like that. Yes, uh, a quick question. Uh, I'm laughing because our head of HR is actually sitting in the first row here. Right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it's a great question. Huh? Um, so we are actually right now looking at how can we best measure an engagement. You know, everyone has a feeling around engagement. How do people? How does it feel? What's the vibe in the in the office? And sometimes people have different views um, around this. Um, and we want to, I mean, we're like a super data driven company. We want to actually get a bit more data on this. So we, um, in, in actually, two years ago, we were, I, I was asking a simple survey monkey question. Huh? Would you recommend working at eDreams to a friend? Assuming that the friend is qualified to work uh, there. Um, and if we, we've been doing that every year, uh, but we'll, right now, um, having a very active conversation around doing that much, much more frequently. There's different ways of doing it. There's different tools out there in the market that are um, really interesting, um, and, and you know, I think we're just about to, to launch into something more uh, more iterative in that respect. Yes, there is one more question back there. Uh, yeah, the microphone is coming. Thank you. Uh, how frequently people change of domain or teams or? This kind of yes, context. it's almost a religious question. That's very good, huh? because I think there's two different views um, on, on this. I, my personal opinion is, um, I want the teams to be stable, because there's another school of thought saying, hey, let's put these project teams together so that they don't need anyone else. Uh, my personal view is, I want the teams to be stable, and why? Because I believe ownership is the most important thing. I want them to own the consequence of decisions that they're taking now. Because if you're keeping, if, if you if the teams are changing very frequently, and you have to take a decision, how much do I invest in, in quality? That's maybe I need it in a half a year, and how much do I just get this thing done now? You might be tempted to just, you know, go on the shortcut uh, track. Uh, but I want to have that that kind of thinking with the teams, and, and really, you know, way balance the short term versus the mid term and long term consequences, and that requires. Uh, to keep teams more stable um, in, in it. So, yeah, we absolutely try to keep teams stable. <coughs> there is a difficulty with that. So sometimes, if, if there is, sometimes there is like, maybe even we lose a person, um, and um, there is one back-end developer, uh, and now that, that person is gone, uh, it, it creates problems for us. So we're also moving more into full-stack thinking because of that. 
but we, we try to kind of keep it keep it more stable. I think in the last question time or uh, how many minutes? We have two minutes left. So last question. Hi. Um, you are living through a transformation, right? An agile transformation of some of sorts. Um, my question is, what triggered you? What motivated you to actually go from monolith to domain-based uh, company? Yeah. Um, well, being in a monolithic um, situation makes some things easier and some things harder. Um, for us, the biggest challenge was scale and time to market. So the most important thing I'm, you know, we are optimizing the company for is time to market. Because in the digital world, um, it's not the biggest company that survives, it's the, f the one that can react fastest to changing the market. So if you want to optimize for time to market, a model is not the, right, the, the best kind of solution because all the changes are cumbersome and slow. You know, because you can um, break so many things. On top of that, um, if you're on a model and you want to scale the model, and if you want to make the, the, uh, the big ball of mud, uh, the trigger mud, if you want to make, make that big ball of mud bigger, that's also quite daunting because it makes every, everything bigger and everything also slower. So there is as bigger as it gets, the slower it gets as well. Um, and, and since we wanted to accelerate development, it was clear that this picture is not the, our target picture or the way what we can live with. So it was very clear motivation, but in the end it comes down to this cut down um, time to market or cut down customer lead time um, massively. Sorry, was it more like a, a self-realization within the leadership group, or was it more like um, from the bottom up they were suggesting to move towards this approach, or both? Um, it's difficult for us to answer for that for me. Yeah. So I think it's it, it, there's a clear business need to do that, yeah. Because in the flight in the flight industry, if you don't move, um, you're dead. Um, so there's a clear business need, uh, a clear top-down need. And I think there was also people in the organization that wanted to change, and uh, driving this change in a bottom-up way. Um, there were also other people who liked this kind of living inside the wall, but um, then you need to convince them how nice it is to live in smaller walls. Um, that is for now. So I think it's a, it's, it's a mix of things. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for, for your time. Um, if you have any more questions, you can talk to to me uh, or any of the other <laughs> surprise huh? um, or any of the, the guys in the blue shirts if you want uh, and um, yeah you can also contact me on that on that uh, on that short link thank you very much. Thank you.